Um, the next is a quote um, from, so, I think it's from Saussure, so, yeah, from Saussure. So, um, quote, the elucidation of one language by reference to a related language, right? The elucidation of one language by reference to um, a related language. And what I did was I, I sort of created a, a very simple diagram here. I'm not going to draw it on the board because I have it here. Um, and basically what you'll see is that we have um, a language, a form of a language, and what we're going to do is we're going to, actually I will write, I will draw it. We have a language, we have another language, so this is language one, this is language two, and there's a comparison between the languages, right, as structures, as, as, as structures. And we see that the languages differ insofar as uh, this, how it's spoken. We'll return to um, this distinction between the language and the speech, right? Um, there is a distinction between the language and the speech, the speech being more what, um, what uh, Saussure classifies as uh, parole. I can't speak French, so that was probably bad uh, French. Um, I think it's P. I didn't, did I put this in the notes? I don't think I put this in the notes. Um, P-A-R-O-L-E, right? And the language proper, we'll talk about that later because there's there are various forms of the language proper. Um, it's important to recognize that what we speak, right, the speech that we have is a consequence, right? It is literally, logically, a consequence of the language, right? So that the structure is there as an antecedent, the structure is there, I wouldn't say primordially, but the, the structure is there conceptually prior to the speech of the language. And the question is, well, first of all, why is that true, and what does that mean? So I'll, I'll, I'll pause, right? Um, the first thing to recognize, and, and I have it in the, the title, I don't have it on the board, but the, the second part of the title is, and the evolving linguistic community. The thing that we have to recognize in semiotics, um, in semiology, in a discourse on semiotics, is that the language is a given, right? It is a given. We are born into the language. So if this is a timeline, right, and here is sort of my lifespan, um, prior to, this is when I was born, and this is when I'm going to die, and here's today, prior to my birth, right, there was the language. And after my death, there will be the language. And what happens is I am, I'm literally born into the language, right, I'm born into the language. This is, this is evidenced by the fact that uh, you could be an American and um, have your child born in the States, and let's say you're an army guy or military brat or whatever, and you travel overseas, you go to uh, China for, you know, 15 years, your child grows up in China, your child's going to speak um, Mandarin, right? You go, to, you go to Brazil for a couple years, your child speak Portuguese. France, your, 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 your child speak French, right? Why? Because the structure is already in place. The linguistic community, which is represented sort of by the timeline itself, the community has already established the language. The language is, has already taken root in literally the bodies, the beings in that community. So that when I am born, I am literally born into the language. We'll see the, the ramifications of this later, and it gets really, really deep. Because not only am I born into the language, not only is it the case that I speak you know, French if I'm in France, or I speak English, I speak American, <laughs> or I speak English if I'm in America, but I think French, right? I think German, I think um, Mandarin, I think English, right? I think that way. Um, and there's even repercussions sort of deeper than that, but just to get your, get, you should have an idea of where this is going, is that the language is already there before me, it'll be there after me, and what happens is I'm born into, I'm born into the, uh, the language. So, with respect to the, the spoken aspect, the spoken feature of, of language, that feature is, as I said, a consequence. It's a consequence. It's an antecedent, if you think of it, right? The, uh, the, the ability to speak it, the speech act, is a consequence of the language, which is demonstrated by this example, right? Um, the language is a necessary, uh, and we'll see later if it's sufficient or not, I don't want to get, give too much away, 
but it is a necessary condition for the Speech Act. It antecedes, it, it, it comes before the Speech Act, which is represented by this diagram. In this diagram, prior to my birth, there was a language. That ability, the fact that there was this language prior to my birth, allows for me to be able to immerse myself within the language and to sort of conceptualize and think in terms of the language. It's at that level that the analysis is going to go. Right now it's very sort of introductory, but eventually what we'll do is we'll get further and further away from the Speech Act and more and, uh, and, and approximate more the thought, the, con the, the conceptual level, um, and this, this is where it gets really interesting. This is where uh, all the magic happens. All right. Um, next thing to recognize under under the comparative philology, comparative grammar, is that primitive elements are vital uh, for reconstruction. Right? Primitive ele elements are vital for reconstruction, and I'll talk about this in, in detail later. But the idea is this: insofar as I uh, as a human being, remember the, the type of uh, semiotics that I'm going to be doing in this whole series is going to be anthroposemiotics, right? I'm not going to do other forms of semiotics because I'm only sort of interested in human cognition. And I gave a little bit too much away. But insofar as, in the background, what I'm really going to be talking about is cognition and our ability to think, our ability to conceptualize, then it has to be the case that there are preconditions for our cognition, right? Preconditions not only for our language, but preconditions for our ability to think. Um, we can't really make sense of what those preconditions are just yet. Why? Because I, I just began the lecture. Um, what we'll see is, as we progress through the dis discourse, it's really when we get to Lacan that Lacan is really going to spell out via Freud um, what the preconditions are for... Uh, he doesn't say it like this, but this is at least my interpretation of it. The preconditions for uh, not only cognition, but preconditions for, for language. Um, because if it is argued, and you guys said you wanted it deep, so I'm going to give it to you deep. If it is argued that we are, and it's obvious, that we're social beings, and if it's also the case that our language frames the way that we think, our cognitive ability to process information is, is, is linguistic, then it has to be the case that whatever preconditions we have uh, for speech are preconditions for thought. Okay, that might have been a little too fast, so I'll go through it a little bit slower, but I'm not going to spend too much time on it, on it now because I'll, I'll go more in depth later. If it's the case, right, if it's the case that we say that our language and our thought, our ability to think, are basically one and the same, right? So our ability to speak and make sense of the world, and we'll, I have a lot to do to talk about that, that's the first part of that would be like the first two or three hours of the lecture, and then the last part would be about thought. Our, our ability to make sense of the world um, is bound, inextricably bound, to our ability to, to process this information, our ability to think, literally, our thought, then whatever, and you can see this is a biconditional, right? This is, I mean, literally, logically, this is a biconditional, then whatever are, whatever serves as the necessary and sufficient conditions for language, right? whatever serves as a precondition for language, has to also serve as a precondition for thought, because they're bound. And that's the, that's the secret. Um, I personally, I haven't seen much research done on this. Uh, Lacan doesn't speak of it, so Sir doesn't necessarily talk on it. Lacan sort of, uh, he broaches it, um, this idea, as sort of articulated in this sense. But what I want to do by the end of the, the video series is to give you at least my interpretation of the preconditions, right? So the question, the big question is, what are the so that's the big question, right? What are the preconditions for language? If we can offer, and they do, everybody, they're all, all of these um, um, semiologists are attempting, and you know, there's debate between academics what the preconditions are, but if we can articulate the, and justify our articulation of the preconditions for language, 
then we necessarily articulate the preconditions for thought. And that's the second part that's important. Um, insofar as we articulate these preconditions for thought, then what we're doing, in a sense, and you know, in the background, even on a very deep level, um, then what we're doing is we're sort of articulation, articulating the preconditions for our cognitive ability, the way we process information, and as all philosophers are trying to do, we're trying to, we're trying to take it to the robots, right? We, then, then we can talk about, uh, we can talk about robots, right? Because if I can understand how I think as a human being, right, my cognitive abilities, what makes me come to a sense of awareness, and this symbol will be important later, this symbol of a tree, then if I know exactly what this is and the conditions that allow for the existence of this state of affairs, then why wouldn't it be the case that I could repl replicate that state of affairs in a non-biological, non-sentient uh, being, uh, in, a, in a robot, right? And this is what Asimov is all about, right? So anytime you, uh, anytime you, anytime you um, really delve into semiotics, um, you're going to get, also, it's, it's, it's unavoidable that you're going to get into uh, pretty advanced logic, depending on how deep you go. And when you get to that level, the combination of symbol, interpretation, meaning, value, and logic, you know, we're, we're going to end up talking about robots. So, <laughs> at least I'm going to end up talking about robots. Alright, so robots, language, all that happy stuff.